All right, here we are with another episode of Ask the Experts. I'm here with uh, the good doctor, Dr. Darren Bright. Thanks for being with us today. Absolutely. We are going to be talking about some of the most common injuries that runners uh, encounter throughout their training, whether it's for a half marathon, full marathon, even a, a, for a 5K. Um, so uh, thank you for being here. Um, you obviously, you run the Max Sports Endurance Academy uh, as part of Ohio Health. You've got your practice on Old Tangier River Road, also here in New Albany. Um, and you're also the medical director for the Columbus Marathon. Correct. Excellent. Um, and you've been doing plenty of marathons yourself, but you also are kind of the go-to uh, physician here in Central Ohio for a lot of the runners in Central Ohio. So no doubt you've seen a whole lot of injuries over your career. Um, what would you say are kind of the top three injuries that we, that we see uh, out of runners and walkers? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the most common thing I see is going to be runner's knee, uh, which has to do with some imbalances in the thigh muscles and hip muscles that lead to some uh, knee pain. Uh, then the second most common thing would probably be stress fractures if we lump them all together. Uh, obviously a lot of different types of stress fractures, but stress fractures would probably be the next most common thing I see. And then from there, I would probably say plantar fasciitis um, would be the next most common thing I see. Well, let's um, dive into a couple of those. Um, I know we see a lot of folks that come into the store that are um, dealing with runner's knee, plantar fasciitis for sure. Uh, another one that we hear a lot about is piriformis. It's Absolutely, just, yep. and that's uh, definitely up there in the, in the top four. Yep, uh, we, we could cover stretch fractures all day, and I don't know that anybody wants to sit here and listen to us talk about every <laughs> stretch fracture. So, um, runner's knee. Um, if that's the number one injury that we're gonna see out of a lot of runners, um, roughly how many folks out on the trails, whether they're doing a marathon, half marathon, might run into runner's knee, and what is runner's knee? Yeah, so um, in terms of you know, the incidence of it, uh, some studies have shown up to 25% of all athletes at some point will suffer from uh, anterior knee pain, uh, which is the pain on the front of the knee, which would be uh, runner's knee. So it, it, it's pretty common, and when we look at um, knee pain in runners, uh, half of all knee pain will be related to runner's knee. So uh, pretty common ailment. Uh, has a lot to do with, uh, again, those muscle um, imbalances in our thigh and our hip muscles. And as we get some of those imbalances, the kneecap starts rubbing on the end of the thigh bone, and then that leads to pain and inflammation in the knee. Um, so pain's usually on the front of the knee. Um, what sort of sensation might they be feeling with that? Yeah, so obviously pain is going to be one of the main things, but uh, there'll be certain um, activities that will make it worse than others. So people uh, who complain of pain going uh, downstairs, frequently that's going to be runner's knee, uh, pain with kneeling, squatting, lunging, uh, sometimes sitting for prolonged periods of time, so we'll call that the theater sign. Uh, but classically, it's going to be on the front of the knee as opposed to the second most common cause for knee pain, which is IT band, and that pain will be on the outside of the knee. So okay. pretty easy to distinguish those two conditions just based off of where's the pain. Uh, you mentioned with runner's knee a lot of times it's uh, muscle imbalances that will kind of lead to that. What sort of um, things can we do to help try to prevent runner's knee? Yeah, so I, I think one of the biggest things is, well, shoe fit's an important thing. Uh, when we look at the biomechanics of the knee, a lot of that relates to the biomechanics of our foot. And so we need to make sure we have good mechanics and a good foundation uh, to run on and walk on. So I think shoe fit's a very important part of that process. And so is uh, just some general strengthening and stretching. Uh, we put some exercises up on uh, the um, uh, library before in terms of those runners and walkers 10, uh, which has to do with 10 exercises that we think are important to help maintaining that uh, balance and strength in our hip and our thigh muscles. Um, when you see someone in the office that's got you know, patellar tendonitis, um, what do you tell them to get back on the road to recovery? Um, well, I think first of all, it's uh, isolating those imbalances and those weaknesses and starting some exercises for that uh, to address those. Um, ice can be very helpful. Ice helps with inflammation. Uh, probably one of the best things that we have for inflammation, probably better than anti-inflammatory. So I do recommend icing after activity and then again at bedtime. And then using pain as your guide as you're running. Um, if it's hurting a lot, we're out there limping, we've got to back off for a while, allow uh, for time to heal. Uh, but if we're able to get those runs and walks in uh, without limping, then it's probably okay to do. Yeah. 
Um, well, things like the, uh, the the surgical tubing strap that people wear around their knee, will that kind of can that help with that, or is that uh, more IT then? Yeah. So for patellar tendonitis, which is a little bit different, uh, that can help, and a okay. lot of people wear what will wear those straps. I find that can be beneficial. Uh, but for runner's knee. Sometimes people feel a little bit better with some of the taping or uh, some of the uh, knee sleeves. And if it feels better, it's probably okay to do. It's not gonna do any damage. Okay. Uh, but the literature on bracing, taping, strapping for runner's knee, uh, not, not really strong. Gotcha. So, um, plantar fasciitis. Again, that's something that we see a whole lot in the stores. Um, we hear about it after um, workouts, whether it's with MIT or in a boundaries group. Um, what is plantar fasciitis? Let's just start at the beginning. Yeah, so plantar fasciitis has to do with the muscle through the arch of the foot. Um, and as that muscle starts to get tight uh, and we bear weight on it repetitively, that generates a lot of tension right where the muscle attaches to the heel bone. Okay. And as a result, people will experience pain there. Um, my feeling is it has a lot to do with arch mechanics. Uh, maybe we're not properly supporting the arch. And so that's why you know, a lot of people that I see with plantar fasciitis, one of the first things I do is say, go get fitted for uh, shoes, look into possibly doing some inserts because if we can support that arch as people bear weight on it, it won't generate as much tension there. Uh, so I think shoe fit um, and or inserts can definitely help a lot. And it also has a lot to do with flexibility through the calf and the heel cords. Uh, if we're really tight through those muscles as we bear weight on it, it's going to generate a lot more tension. If we have some flexibility through those muscles, some, uh, which can you know, be improved through stretching, uh, that's going to help. Um, you mentioned that, and I'm pointing at my hand, this is my heel. A lot of folks will feel, feel that right at where it inserts in the heel. Are there other parts of the foot that they might be feeling uh, symptoms of plantar fasciitis? Yeah, certainly. It can go all the way out through the arch. So some people can feel it all through the arch into the base of the toes. Some people experience tightness all the way up into the calf muscles. So absolutely. But classically, people will complain of that pain right at the base of the heel, first steps out of bed in the morning, seems to loosen up as the day goes on. But uh, you, you can certainly get some, some other symptoms. And then as people you know, suffer with it for a long period of time, they can start to change their, their body mechanics and then they up with pain other, other places, whether it's the knee, the shins, the hips, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, you mentioned a little bit about shoes and such, but how important is the shoe fit? Uh, in terms of preventing or and or recovering from plantar fasciitis? Yeah, I think it's critical. Um, you know, I remember a good friend of mine who suffered with this and uh, everybody seems to uh, have that thing that got them better. And I remember asking him, what was it that got your plantar fasciitis better? He says, I never went anywhere without my shoes. Uh, he kept his shoes next to his nightstand. Uh, when he'd get, to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, he'd put his shoes on. Yeah. So I think it's just absolutely essential to have that uh, proper support uh, through the arch, through shoes and inserts in order to recover from it and to hopefully uh, prevent it from coming back. Uh, what about inserts or even custom insoles? Um, can those be a benefit? Yeah, uh, you know, I usually recommend the over-the-counter, uh, whether it's a Superfeet or something like that, uh, because um, they're a lot cheaper. Uh, and anymore now with the technology involved and creating some of the over-the-counter inserts, it's just as good as a lot of the custom inserts. And, um, you know, I'd much rather pay $35, $40 for an insert rather sure. than uh, four or five hundred dollars for an insert. Um, but there are some people uh, that when the over-the-counter don't work, sometimes we do need that custom orthotic and it definitely still has its role, but I find it's becoming uh, less uh, less significant. Uh, and certainly trying that over-the-counter one's probably best. Yeah. Uh, so there might be a little misconception, I think, um, between the role of a shoe and the role of an insert. And I think when it comes to plantar fasciitis, it can maybe be demonstrated a little bit better. What is the role of the insole in a shoe in terms of specifically as it relates to plantar fasciitis that's gonna help with that? Yeah, so you know the way I kind of look at it is I, I, I think of the shoe as a very good uh, device for controlling pronation, providing more cushioning for someone who has a higher arch, but I don't find it does quite as good of a job at supporting the arch uh, when um, we need that extra support. That's and true. so if you look at what comes in a shoe, you know, when you buy, get it out of the box, pull out that little, you know, shoe liner. I mean, that's about all it is, it's yeah. a shoe liner. And there isn't much to it in terms of supporting the arch. So uh, an insert uh, or an orthotic involves removing that little shoe liner and then providing something into the shoe that can provide um, 
more support for the arch. Gotcha. Um, some runners, and I've been one that has also benefited from this, um, will get um, their foot taped mm -hmm. uh, for plantar fasciitis. What's, um, can that work? And what's the kind of the, the difference between doing that and having um, really working with shoes and insoles to help? Yeah. So the way I look at that is I think of arch taping uh, as a, a middle ground to see if somebody might benefit from a more custom orthotic. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody experiences good pain relief with arch taping, there's a good chance they need a little bit more support than what they're already getting. Gotcha. Uh, and that's where the insert or the orthotic might be beneficial. And then there are definitely people who, you know, have some resolution of symptoms with arch taping and in the interim, you know, that, that's a great thing. Yeah. So if arch taping works, you know, absolutely something I would uh, uh, recommend. Um, so we've talked about shoes and insoles as it relates to plantar fasciitis. So what else can we do um, to either help prevent it or help it kind of, you know, recover from it? So whether it's, um, you know, using the calf stretcher, um, what else can we do? Yeah, so calf stretching, uh, arch stretching, uh, or heel cord stretching is very important. So adding in those exercises to get that flexibility through the arch and the, the, the heel and the, the calf muscles is going to be important. Uh, surfaces we run on probably play a role as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, asphalt is probably a little bit better in concrete. Um, the flatter surfaces when somebody's really struggling with plantar fasciitis is going to be better than hills. Uh, any extra strain through the arch is going to be detrimental. So yeah. speed workouts, uh, hill workouts, all that can add some extra stress. So those are things we might want to pull back on while we're recovering from it. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's talk uh, lastly about piriformis. So okay. what is the piriformis? Where is it at? And um, what, 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 why yeah. do we hear about it? So uh, the piriformis is a muscle that runs from your tailbone across to the hip bone. It's deep inside uh, the butt, uh, and it's a very important muscle that really works with a lot of the other muscles in the, uh, the hip region to help stabilize the hip and pelvis. Uh, it's a very small muscle uh, and is prone to injury, and uh, once it gets injured, it has a tendency just to completely shut down. Yeah. And then it uh, really puts a lot of stress on the other muscles of the hip and pelvis to stabilize, uh, and then those muscles start to, you know, break down and show injury, and uh, as a result, people end up with a lot of pain in the uh, the backside. And sometimes, because of the uh, proximity of the piriformis to the sciatic nerve, it'll even inflame the sciatic nerve, and people will get pain radiating all the way down the leg. So it's a very important muscle, and it's a muscle that's really uh, very prone to being injured in runners and walkers. Um. A few years back, you published an article in Runner's World, and you, uh, and it was all about dead butt syndrome, piriformis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why did you give this painful, lovely thing <laughs> uh, a name such as dead butt? Yeah. So I think it has to do with that um, <laughs> when the piriformis shuts down, it starts to put all the other muscles under strain, and eventually those muscles shut down and uh, sets up the syndrome where the muscles in the butt just aren't activating. Yeah. And so it led to that kind of coining that term dead butt syndrome. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's a tough problem, uh, especially trying to get those muscles to come back to life. Uh, and that's where uh, aggressive physical therapy, working on strengthening of those muscles, trying to get those muscles to fire and activate again is essential. Um, a lot of people, when you read about this on the internet, they're just gonna see a lot of stretching exercises for the piriformis. My experience is the stretching a muscle that's not activating isn't going to help too much. It's more about activating that muscle, and that's where uh, the strengthening is so important in getting it back. What uh, what what strengthening exercises should we should we be doing? So a lot of those are on the uh, on the uh, website uh, with the runners and walkers ten. Uh, so they're going to be a lot of hip strengthening exercises. So uh, some of the ones we call hip hikers. Uh, which involves activation of our glute muscles and the other muscles in the uh, gluteal region, uh, as well as some clams and sideline straight leg raises. Uh, just a lot of exercises focusing on strengthening of those muscles. Okay, uh, and for you at home, if you don't know the, the, the link you just referenced, um, if you go to fleetfeetcolumbus.com and then click the resources tab, there is a whole library of articles there uh, covering everything you could ever hope to learn. Uh, but there is an article um, that Sean Upman wrote and put together about the runners and walkers 10. Those are those exercises he's referring to. Um, so what, what, can, what else can we do to help maybe prevent 
even getting to the point where the piriformis is hurting, um, or once you've got it, how can we kind of get back on the path to running with, with piriformis? Yeah, so I think um, as runners and walkers, if we only do that activity, we're going to develop some of those muscle imbalances that can predispose to uh, the dead butt syndrome. So if we can focus on some cross training, whether it's through some of those strengthening exercises, uh, yoga, Pilates, stuff like that to help maintain some of those muscles, I think that could help with prevention. Uh, and then just like with any injury prevention, you know, we need to be smart in our mileage increases. We need to be careful in terms of how we incorporate speed workouts and hill workouts and just be thoughtful in that. Uh, that's gonna be the best way to try to prevent this. Okay, so we've covered Runner's knee, plantar fasciitis, piriformis syndrome. There's a whole slew of other injuries out there. And again, we, a lot of this is content on the, the Fleet Feet site and the, the resources tab. Um, if you could give one piece of additional advice to somebody out there going out to train for a 5K half, full marathon, whatever, um, because a lot of us will just focus on knocking out miles on the calendar. What else can we do to try to stay healthy? Yeah, so I'll probably say more than one thing. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, first and foremost is make sure uh, you've had somebody look at your shoes, uh, you have the right running shoes, and you're changing those out regularly. That's where, you know, the foot strikes the ground, and we do that a lot when we're running and walking. And uh, four to five times your body weight has to be absorbed by your body every foot strike. And if you don't have the right foundation for that, it leads to a lot of imbalances that uh, lead to injury. So that's one of the first things I look at. And then I think about being balanced in our workouts. You know, make sure we're adding in those stretching exercises, we're adding in those strengthening exercises. And then follow schedule. Um, don't just jump in and uh, uh, build up your mileage too quickly. Be thoughtful in those increases. And, and that's all about following a program and a schedule just like uh, MIT. Excellent. Well, Dr. Bright, Thank you so much. I know we'll see you out on the trails with the training group, and then we'll see you at the Columbus Marathon. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, stay tuned. We've got a whole lot more of these episodes of Ask the Experts coming your way. Have a great run.